Cheatham father and my wife Helen is there. Anyway, Jamo is uh, on staff at DuSable Museum. He uh, graduated from the School Art Institute in Ch of Chicago. Dr. Margaret Burroughs was the one who, uh, who recommended him to go to the uh, School of the Art Institute in Chicago, which he graduated from. And he is a uh, part of the educational department at DuSable. And I'd like to introduce to you my only son, my seventh son, <laughs> Jamo Kenyatta Cheetah. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I would just uh, say, because of that um, introduction, just to um, make a point of note, I am blessed because that is not the first time that I hear my father actually give me complimentary um, comments. I'm just blessed that a lot of people don't necessarily have that to say that same thing. Here's the deal. Um, Ms. Baby? 
100% correctly answer another question. You 100% correctly answer another question. You nail that other question. You didn't answer my question correctly. But this other question that's related to my question, she 100% nailed. Dig it? Yeah. It's getting strong every time. <laughs> Does anyone know the answer to my question? Who's the very first African-American female arrested in 1955 when I gave a first seat to a European American on a segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama? Now don't take out those androids. Uh, what you got? So what's your name? What is your name? Before you ask the question, what is your name? Good boy. Just I was there and I was there and I hope much with them. I hope much. I lived in Montgomery. Okay. I was there on the day she on the bus. I was there when and I'm watching her and Dr. King. That was December 1st, 1955? 1955. Dig that, okay. Well, who was the first, though? Huh? Who was the first African American female arrested in 1955 when I gave up her seat? Because it wasn't Rose Parks. It was not Rose Parks. I know it's not, but I think that's it. Now, here's the deal. The very first African American female that was arrested back in 1955 when I gave up her seat to a European American on a segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama, is not Dr. Burroughs. Dr. Burroughs was born in Louisiana. That's where she spent most of her time before moving to Chicago. But her name is, because she's still alive, because she was 15 years of age at the time, Claudette Coleman, C-O-L-V-I-N. 15 years of age, Claudette Coleman was the very first African-American female arrested in 1955. For anybody that just goes ahead and automatically assumes that, that Rosa Parks was the second, you would be incorrect because the second African American female arrested in 1955 was 18 years of age, Mary Louise Smith. Ms. Bay, go ahead and remind us once again what the name of the third African American female was arrested. In. <laughs> Rosa Parks, arrested December 1st, 1955. That was kind of an easy question. But the reason why I love that question, if you asked me about five years ago that same question, I would 100% say it rose apart. It's because that information has become a lot more common. Right. And here's the thing. Once you read the story of Claudette Coleman, like I said, she lives in New York State now, you read that some of the reasons why she's not necessarily as well known was because she had certain challenges that the NAACP saw about her character, their perceptions about her character at that particular point in time. She was an unwed mother at that time. But here's the deal. She was also an advocate. She was an activist. And she understood every time she stepped on that segregated bus, her constitutional rights were being violated. She knew that at age 15. That's the first question that I asked my youth. Realize. What I do on a daily basis affects and I deal and engage our youth. And that's one of the questions I ask them because it's relevant. The second question I ask them is this. How did the very first Africans get to the New World? And who brought them? And by and large, the majority of them say that they were brought in shackles and in chains by white people. The white people changed from British, Spaniards, to the Portuguese. But that's not how our people got here. Yet too many people believe that's how the first Africans got here. The largest number of Africans came through that process. That's what we call the transatlantic slave trade. But the first brought themselves. And they arrived about 180 years before Christopher Columbus. That's about show me. Who knew that before I just said it? Who knew that the first Africans that got here to this hemisphere were free? and brought themselves. I got one, got two. This deal, that's, by the time the Columbus arrived, we had at least 2,500 people out here say, in this hemisphere. How'd they get here? Shipbuilding technology. The only group to arrive before them were the Scandinavians, using shipbuilding technology. Here's the thing. If I'm a young child in school, I would want to have that information. Because we are constantly fed, we have been constantly fed about those that have been enslaved. But I want to learn about those innovators. How about y'all? Okay, figure that. Now, that's kind of what I do on a daily basis. 
I am a part of the process that we do over at New South Museum to help educate our youth. And anybody else that cares to come through for an educational interpretive tour at the museum as opposed to our educational public program. That's one of the things we do over at the New South Museum. Who's been to the New South Museum? Excellent. That is your museum. That is the labor of love for the lady and others, not just Dr. Burroughs, but the lady that we're talking about today. Let me um, let me read a little something real quick. I don't mean to bore you, but this is just a little background information on the lady that we are talking about here today. Just a little background information before I just kind of give you, hopefully, a little perspective and something that I hope you will be encouraged by and that you will take with you from this day. Now, I'm humble. Really, I'm not just saying it, but I'm humble. Whenever I deal with the elders, more mature people than myself, in terms of age, I'm not walking into this space with any perceptions that I'm giving you anything. Your record, your experience, it speaks for itself. Hopefully we can contribute towards one another, but I'm humble because I'm not trying to necessarily impart knowledge, but I hope that what I am, what I am able to do is provide a new perspective on looking at certain things that we sometimes take for granted. Because I'll tell you this, and Dr. Um, Dr. Sanson just basically mentioned this. We sometimes take ourselves for granted. We take ourselves for granted by what we eat, by what we think of ourselves, and what we think about the group that we belong to. And just to understand what Dr. Burroughs did, as well as, person, as, well as uh, those other educators that helped to start a place like yourself. I know you've been there. I know you realize how important that place is. But I want you to also understand a few other things that I want you to take on an individual and personal level. I'm going to get towards that a little bit later. But just in reading who this woman was. Dr. Margaret Taylor was born November 1st, 1917. She became a noted poet, visual artist, educator, and arts organizer. Born in St. Rose, Louisiana, near New Orleans, Margaret and her parents, Alexandria and Octavia Perry Taylor, relocated to Chicago as Margaret turned to the age of five. She attended Englewood High School and went on to graduate with a BA from the Chicago Teachers College, which is now currently known as Chicago State University, in 1946. And she went on to receive a graduate degree, as my father mentioned earlier, from the Art Institute of Chicago in 1948. Margaret married the artist Bernard Goss in 1939, and they divorced in 1947. One child was produced from that union. Her name was Gail. She married Charles Gordon Burroughs in 1949. They remained together until his transition in 1994. That union produced one child. His name was Paul. Anybody in this space had an opportunity to meet personally Dr. Burroughs? All the time, <laughs> Because even if it did, just to reinforce what's already been established and stated, Dr. Burroughs loved you. She loved you. Dr. Burroughs was one of the most humane person, the most caring, patient person I have ever met. And I've met a lot of people with that uh, constitution. But she was this person. She was real calm, too. Just a very patient woman. But here's the thing. I kind of want to liken it to this. Um, God loves everybody, but the Bible basically identified this. The Israelites were the apple of God's eye. That's how Dr. Burroughs was. She loved everybody. But black people, that was her heart. This poem, which I am not about to read this entire poem, this is a long poem. Who's ever read this poem before today? You better go read it. Actually, let me ask you a question. You read this poem before today? How did it affect you once you read this poem? I guess like the beginning, uh, you know, it, it made me realize that the way you know, we, the history had taught us, like everything was black, was, was black and negative, and the, it, was, it was everything associated with good was always white. And it made me, made me realize, what I didn't realize before, like, you know, that's the way our society had trained us. And then it made me realize that, that you know, that, that was 
as true as this far as how it would be felt in terms of this. And that's what she wanted. By writing this poem, this work of art, now she was great friends with the poet Gwendolyn Brooks. But, and actually my understanding, the title of this poem was basically extrapolated from a poem that was written by Gwendolyn Brooks. But when you read this poem, this is a long poem. It's kind of Okay, I'll say it take up three pages. Okay, but two pages. But let me read one excerpt. From, excerpt that I read to our kids, and actually I don't even read it. I have them read it to the group. I will point out one child from the group, and I will say, read this one excerpt, and then read the entire poem once you have time. But this one excerpt I think is very important. I'm going to add one word to it because in the version that I have, this poem has been modified a few times, but in the version I have, there's this one word that's very important that's missing from this particular version. I'm going to insert that, you'll know what it is when I insert it. What can I say therefore when my child comes home, to, comes home in tears because a playmate identical to him has called him black? Big lipped, flat nosed, and nappy headed. What will he think when I dry his tears and whisper, yes, that's true, but no less beautiful and dear? How shall I lift up his head, get him to square his shoulders, look his adversary straight in the eye, confident in the knowledge of his work, serene under his sable skin, and proud of his own beauty? Now, like I said, she modified this thing a few times, but the insertion of that word identical to him is very important to kind of hold on to it. I've seen this, this version before. But the reason why I like to make sure that our kids read the ones that it says a playmate identical to him, because Dr. Burroughs is hitting it right there in the mail. Does anyone have any idea what she's, what she's kind of alluding to when she inserts that word into this particular section of the poem? What's she referring to? Self-hate. You're absolutely right. Self-hate. That is inherent. Why? And then it goes on, how am I going to raise this child up to be serene in their sable skin, confident in their beauty, and aware of their historic heritage and their knowledge? Confident to look their adversaries, whoever they may be, in the eye. How are we going to do that? By knowing our history. And that's going to lead to why this woman did something extraordinary. She left a template that we can continue at any age. Like I said, my apologies for my tardiness today. I said that's Ms. Jenkins earlier. But we had a group of like 120 youth that uh, came to the museum for a group this morning. And just before I walked out the door, I had to give a real brief overview of some of that. But it's always about making sure they got to know their history. And how did the very first Africans get here? The ingenuity, the inventiveness, the science, the technology that took those Africans from West Africa, from the, from the country of Mali, to get here in 1311, about 180 years before, like I said, Columbus in 1492. I want to know about them in addition to the 15 to 25 million that were brought here and went east through the transatlantic slave trade. I want to know about that. But that's balance, because that's going to also give me some strength and understanding about what we're capable of doing. And here's the other thing that um, some people, some people stay away from the Southern Museum because, or places like that, because, you know, I'm tired of slavery. I'm not. And the reason I'm not is simply because I understand this. Just like Dr. Burroughs understood and loved all humanity, I understand this about humans and what we do to ourselves. We enslave each other. So when I'm talking about enslavement at the Dusabo Museum, I'm not just talking about those 15 to 25 million Africans that came from the continent between the 15th century up until about the 18th century. I want to know about those Africans that were free and arrived here. But then if I'm talking about slavery, then I got to talk about those incarcerated, enslaved Chinese people that were enslaved by the Japanese in the 1940s? I want to know about that. I want to know about the Greeks that were enslaved by the Romans. See, I'm talking about enslavement now. I'm talking about this human existence. 
the European or even European enslavement. Two dynasties that were owned and operated in Egypt were controlled by the Nubians. That was your best. And the Nubians are as black, if not black, than my man's best right there. That's history. That's context. That's providing information that you can use. That's going to empower and not diminish. But that's the beauty of this poem. And that's also the beauty of people like Dr. Burroughs. I had an opportunity to meet Dr. Burroughs in 1987. My father and I went on a trip with Dr. Burroughs. Anyone that knows Dr. Burroughs knows that she was a world traveler. She went all over this globe. It's not a single continent she did not visit, almost multiple trips annually. But in 1987, we went on a commercial excursion to basically foster relationships. They're very informal. Um, to build better relationships between African Americans and Africans in the on the West Coast in places like the Gambia and Senegal. And had an opportunity to spend some time with Dr. Burroughs. And that trip, the whole thing about that trip, it was to also make sure that the journalist, the, um, the late great journalist, Lou Palmer, who had never been before, one of the strong, one of the staunchest pan-Africanists this country's ever produced, that was his first time going to Africa. So Lou wanted to go. Dr. Burroughs rallied, rallied up the group so that we could take Lou to Africa, take him home as we call it. So I had an opportunity to spend some time with Dr. Burroughs, in addition to I've been to the museum a few times with my parents. But this was this woman was excellent. And her life was in struggle. I'm gonna get to three points that I think Dr. Burroughs' life gives us something that we can take with us today. I don't care where we are, where we come from. Ages. I hope that we can do something with it. But, um, and also just in passing, she, uh, 987, once we went down, once we went to us, I'm going again. But she also gave me one of the best verbal compliments I've ever received in my life. One day I was walking a group, I was touring a group at the museum, and they, uh, all these kids, imagine all these kids, about 30 kids behind me. Dr. Burroughs was in the museum. Dr. Burroughs had basically, by this time, I started at the USAPA Museum January 7, 2002. I never knew that that's where my life was going to be, my life was going to carry me. Dr. Burroughs, as my father did mention, she was one of my recommendation letters to get to the School of the Artist, too. But after all this time, different um, career outlets, I ended up at the USAPA Museum in 2002. I met Dr. Burroughs a few times, obviously on the premises, but this time she was at the Chicago Park District, and she came to the Gustavo Museum in an uh, intermittent fashion. Yeah. One day I was walking this group of kids through the museum, and she was already there because she conducted interviews there all the time. People were wanting to interview Dr. Burroughs constantly. Even last year we honored her, they honored her as an artist too, and uh, she was constantly being asked for interviews. And she was basically around right here, I walked I give her just a cursory and acknowledgement because I don't want to interrupt her in the interview. But Dr. Burroughs, as she was being interviewed by this group, she stopped and interrupted that interview to make an observation that I was pleased with because it was complimentary, but it was, it was kind of cool. <clears throat> she stopped to say, I have a purposeful walk. Just the way I stride or something like that. Now, don't look at me now. <laughs> you know, that's going to be in But she said I had a purpose to walk. And the reason why I like that compliment so much is because actually it did two things. It reminded me of two things. One, it's a genetic thing. I don't know if parents would to some degree. It means the way you walk is also an indication of where you've been. You know, if you walk a certain way, it kind of indicates the people that affected your life. You kind of slush over, don't really make eye contact. It is an indication, in many cases, not always, of the kind of life that you have led. And it's quite possible that maybe you didn't receive confidence. Not about being, you know, but just encouraging. But it also basically um, reflected how I felt that day and at that moment because I was doing what I was doing. And she picked up on that. It was unconscious of, you know, I was unconscious of it, but she got me to notice it. I was proud of what I was doing. 
I was proud because I was educated. I was part of the educational process of our youth. And I believe that every time we throw some information and education and knowledge on our youth, anybody there under my age is by you, then that's a worthwhile pursuit. And we are arming them because this world, this country, it has done everything to tear us down. You're nasty, you're dirty, you're stinky, you're ugly, you're unintelligent, you produce nothing, you're parasitic. That has been said about us, but everything to the contrary has contradicted that because we rise. People like Dr. Burroughs, yourselves, like Samson, Ms. Jenkins, and Cheetah, and throw him in that mix. Young lady right here, brother right there, what contradictions to those derogatory statements? Three things that Dr. Burrell, I think, we should take with us and add to our repertoire are these, are as follows, and I'll be brief and I will conclude. Many of you are already doing these. Keep doing them. But Dr. Burrell's life is instructed on work to be a part of something larger to you than yourself. So the main reason I believe that Dr. Burroughs lived so long was because she embraced her creativity and because her life was about service to others, especially people of African descent. As I mentioned earlier, she was one of the most even-tempered human beings I've ever encountered, but her love for African people was apparent, whether through her prison ministry, I know that she and um, Reverend Samson participated in that uh, periodically, through their art and helping our incarcerated population our incarcerated population understand how to engage their creative aspects and their creative side so that once they come out, that they will have something to hold on to. While they're inside, they will know that they are worth something and that they are just not about emptiness and nothing. She was an advocate, and her life was devoted to helping others be a part of something Large I know your affiliation with places like Fernwood and other organizations that you belong to, you're showcasing and displaying that attribute. Second thing, and this is where I talk about taking yourselves for granted. Embrace your creativity. What artists do matter. By a show of hands, how many artists do I have in this room right now? By a show of hands, raise my hand. And here's the deal, once you raise your hand in my presence, you got to go back to 1968 to um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos back in uh, the Olympics in uh, Mexico City. You got to go like that. And see, you can lose the fish. You feel like this. But when you raise your hand, that's how you got to roll. So if you are an artist, raise your hand. Boom, bam, boom, boom. But here's the deal. Boom. See, I didn't ask if you could paint a drop. I asked, are you an artist? How do you express yourself? So that means, anybody in here? Don't have a corporate? And this is the, um, and by the way, I want to um, relate this to what um, Ms. Jenkins was talking about earlier, that plant project. And that's the botany and gardens, part of your art. Get on top of that plant project. Collect that man's $200, his $100, his $50, and use some artistry to make those those plants grow. That's part of our art as well. Last point is the evidence. Whatever your love is, make sure that there is evidence to support where your love is. Dr. Burroughs' love, you can see it. It's an evidence at 3806 South Michigan Avenue at the very first beginning of the New South Wales Museum, as well as across the street of the Southside Community Art Center. It's also in evidence at 740 East 56th Place at where the current location of the New Southland Museum is located. But not just the buildings. We're not important because of the building, but the people that were edified and nourished intellectually through the information that they received from places like that. And then you still be like disciples, just like you disciples in Fernwood. You go out, you share it. You're part of the process of making sure we know this beautiful thing we call African American history, or whatever else it is that you are impassioned by. In closing, 
I cross paths with the person like Dr. Burroughs. And just because I cross paths with a person like Dr. Burroughs, that didn't mean anything about being destined to be like a great man or something like that. Not a great man. By any script. But by being in contact with people like Dr. Burroughs, it did not only encourage me, but it gave me the mandate. I gotta be a better man. I gotta be a better person. Just like we are all better people from having come in contact with each other. And people like Dr. Burroughs who may have notoriety, but the same thing that's in hers inside of us. And we are capable and we are responsible to just be better and to be accountable and to make sure that we spread love <coughs> and care. And in honoring Dr. Burroughs here today, we are honoring ourselves. I want to thank you guys for inviting me out here to participate in this honor this great person. And thank you very much just for